got sound and white balance. I know they're doing it now, but they'll come. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Um, Sheriff Neenheis is going to talk about three topics today. Uh, he's going to first follow up with an inmate death that occurred last April. And then he's going to talk about two crimes that the detectives recently made arrests on regarding crimes against children. Sheriff Neenheis and Major Sean Kluznick, our jail administrator, are going to speak first about the follow-up on the inmate death. Oh, I'm sorry. In the interest of time, we're going to have time for questions only related to these topics. If any citizen or media outlet would like additional information about another case or something else, please send it through the website. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming for our media partners. Uh, uh, our first topic we'll get right into is a, um, a, an issue that we had with an individual that we arrested almost exactly a year ago. His name was Timothy Peters. Uh, in, in law enforcement, we deal uh, daily with very difficult situations. Uh, oftentimes they're heart-wrenching, uh, they're tragic, uh, but unfortunately we don't have a choice. We have to deal with those issues. Um, even sometimes when you have the ability of having 2020 hindsight, uh, alternatives aren't necessarily legal or would have any different outcome or would be acceptable by the public. Uh, when we're talking about our jail, uh, about in excess, in excess rather of 4,700 individuals are booked into our county jail uh, in a given year. In this last year, I think it might have been even closer to 4,800. Uh, individuals and um, when we do arrest somebody and prior to taking them to the jail and sometimes even when they get to the jail uh, they are often sent to the emergency room uh, and cleared for any significant issues prior to being booked and that actually happened in this case too and we'll uh, talk about that in a moment um, <clears throat> it's also important to remember that uh, individuals that are arrested uh, have often made, uh, which is common sense, have often made some pretty poor decisions, not just with relating to their crimes, but with their physical as well as their mental health condition prior to the arrest. Uh, it is not unusual for people to be arrested with significant mental health problems and significant physical problems. Sometimes they even have some illnesses uh, that are, are pretty significant. With regard to mental health, sometimes they are even uh, considering self-harm. Now, that's not the case in this, but the bottom line of those 4,700 people we arrest every year, uh, we have to deal with a wide variety of issues with those individuals. And I think, uh, by and large, we do an excellent job at it because we get, a, fortunately, a lot of experience. I also think it's important to remember that when somebody comes in, uh, to the to the uh, jail or into an emergency room or any type of facility that's trying to administer any type of treatment, that person, if they're conscious, uh, it's nearly impossible to force them to accept any type of medicine or any specific medical treatment. And now normally in these types of cases, in deference to the family, we would usually probably not show this video proactively, but we've had some uh, interest both on the web and in social media from some uh, poster or posters, as well as I think a little bit of tra traditional media interest. So we decided to go ahead and uh, brief the media as well as the public as to the events that occurred uh, about a year ago. Now to lay the groundwork, uh, the reason that we interacted with Mr. Peters is on April 13th at about 5.49 in the morning, so it was obviously in the very early morning hours. A lot of people were probably getting up and getting ready to go to work. Uh, we got a call that Mr. Peters was banging violently on the door of a neighbor's house. He was acting irrationally, and uh, it was told that he was trying to, I guess, evangelize that neighbor. He was obviously intoxicated. The neighbor was concerned enough to not just call us, but the neighbor did arm himself with a firearm. And uh, of course, law enforcement responded, as well as Mr. Peters' uh, wife. <clears throat> Mr. Peters refused to leave that neighbor's uh, property. 
And he actually, he could not be calmed down by either us using our uh, CIT skills and nor his wife. He actually swung a beer bottle at one of the deputies and he advised those deputies that he was going to continue to fight and resist unless or until we gave him another beer. He actually grabbed during the scuffle a deputy's thigh and kicked another one in the shin. Once he was in the car, he moved those handcuffs from the back to the front and started pounding on the window with the handcuffs. When he was removed to try to re-restrain him, he kicked a couple extra, uh, a couple additional deputies. Of course, he was, uh, had to be um, shackled and hobbled to try to prevent him from hurting himself, but it didn't initially do any good. Once he was put back in the car, he was thrusting himself against the window and the interior of the car. He was uh, taken back out and taken to the ground to get him to try to calm down, and I guess eventually they were able to get him calmed down enough to take him to the hospital to be checked out medically. He didn't spend much time there, and he was ultimately booked and charged with uh, trespassing after warning, uh, resisting arrest with violence, as well as aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. He got to the jail and was booked about 9.15 that morning, so about three, three and a half hours later. His bond was initially $51,000. After he made first appearance with the judge, that was reduced to $26,000. And Major Kluznik is, is going to show us, uh, now obviously the video is, is very long. Uh, he's gonna show us some snippets of what we believe are some uh, pertinent times uh, with Mr. Uh, Peters uh, prior to uh, the event that, uh, or prior to him actually being transported to the hospital where he uh, later uh, died. But uh, I think there's some things that we really need to keep in mind as we're watching this video. He was examined in the emergency room prior to being booked and was checked out and there were no issues noted. When he was booked into the jail, he was immediately placed in our medical wing uh, because of the, uh, the alcohol intoxication and the things that result from that as well as some other medical issues. He never once complained to medical staff or to uh, booking deputies or to the uh, housing deputies that he had any physical pain or illness or injuries uh, when he was actually lucid. About 24 hours after being booked, <clears throat> he started acting a little bit irrational and was taste, uh, placed rather on uh, detoxification or detox protocols. And, um, and again, there was no significant issues. Other than uh, over uh, the next 24 hours, I think maybe they had to put him in our pro-strain chair at one time. Uh, Major Kluznik will talk about that. Um, also, while we're looking at this, keep in mind that these events not just happen in jails throughout the country every single day. Uh, but they happen in emergency rooms every single day. People refuse treatment, they become combative, have to be restrained, have to be cleaned up, and so forth. So after about 48 hours total of being in the sheriff's office in the jail, um, he refused his detox medication as well as an offer of Gatorade. And the nurse offered it several times over the next several minutes. Uh, that followed not long after with him um, having some issues with uh, bodily functions. There is uh, bodily fluids, I think both, uh, if I'm not mistaken, vomit, but definitely uh, excrement and probably some urine on the floor, making the floor extremely slippery. And he was having trouble. He was obviously very irrational, very upset. He was very delusional. And the decision was made to put him in the impact resistant seclusion cell. Now, it's also important to know we only have one of those in the Hernando County Jail and it was occupied. So we had to go through the process of moving that person out and moving him into that uh, cell after he was decontaminated because they were uh, uh, going to spray him with OC spray as well as obviously clean him up from the bodily fluid issue that he had. They also had to gather a team to make sure they could safely move him uh, to ensure that uh, since he was combative that they could actually keep him under control. 
Um, you'll see in the video, and Major Kluznik can talk about this more, but a spit hood was placed on his uh, head to keep uh, you know, any projectile vomiting or spitting or anything like that from uh, impacting the deputies. I think it's important to know that these are not you know, thick uh, pieces of uh, cloth. They are very, very sheer, um, and even if wet, they should allow air to pass through. Uh, and it's also important to remember from the time we actually entered the cell uh, till the time CPR was started and life-saving measures was a total of about 21 minutes, and that includes moving him into the showers. It certainly was not an extended period of time. And I think the video shows and the staff will confirm during the interviews that the individual did not stop re resisting um, and did not stop fighting at all during that time until the very, very end, just moments before those life-saving mo moments were uh, beginning to be administered. I think it's also important to rem remember that when somebody stops resisting, several things could be the case. They could be exhausted, they could have passed out, they could decide to be compliant, they could be faking it, and of course they could be having a serious medical issue. And that's why they started, you'll see a sternum rub as well as an ammonia capsule. And then um, <clears throat> the deputy did not even wait to take the person out of this pro chair. During the process, they decided rather than put him in the impact seclusion room, they were gonna put him in a pro chair, probably so they could keep a better eye on him. And he was being buckled into that when he uh, stopped resisting. And uh, the deputy, you'll see, starting to do uh, very aggressive CPR even before they started taking the straps off. He was transported to the hospital, and he expired the following day on April 16, 2022, uh, I guess at about 7.45 p.m. Also, subsequent to that, several agencies reviewed this. We called FDLE because it was a death, and it was uh, related to uh, custody. So the Florida Department of Law Enforcement came in and assisted in the investigation. Uh, the state attorney's office was involved from the very beginning, and of course the medical examiner did an autopsy and found uh, that there were no concerns noted during the autopsy. There was no physical injuries or trauma that could have even remotely contributed to the death. There were no serious cuts, no broken bones, no um, trauma at all uh, to the body other than maybe some superficial scrapes and so forth. So with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Major Kluznik and maybe have him walk you through the video a little bit and explain some of the things, and then we'll take maybe a couple quick questions on this. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, for the benefit of the media, uh, my name's Sean Kluznik, S-H-A-U-N, last name K-L-U-C-Z-N-I-K. I'm just trying to organize here. Sorry. Okay. All right, so this, this video is about uh, nine minutes long. Actually, it's nine minutes exactly. Um, I'm going to play it, and I'm going to—I plan on playing it all the way through. Uh, so there may be some time we're just sitting here quietly. And sorry for the microphones for dragging that across, but are we going to be able to get a copy of the center? All right. So the first scene is at 7:38 in the morning. Uh, Mr. Peters accepts his. Uh, morning medication. Um, just want to point out, I'm going to back it up again and start over again. Just how uh, lucid and compliant he is being. Yep. Right after the medication, he returns back to his bunk and goes back to sleep. Till uh, lunchtime. That's at 7:41. So 10:30, lunch is delivered. Uh, Mr. Peters accepted his lunch tray, um, and I'd like to point out here he was able to navigate that apple juice carton. Something I have difficulty with at times. It looks like he ingests the entire uh, apple juice. He also ingested a pretty good portion of the lunch. So at 11.03, the demeanor changes tremendously. He's on his knees here and he just 
kind of goes out of control, takes his mattress, throws it across the cell, and is yelling at a deputy that's outside the, the cell door. 12.30, continued to be disruptive, yelling. He's just, that's the top of his lungs, yelling at the top of his lungs there. About 1.57, uh, Mr. Peters has issued multiple orders during his time frame, uh, issued multiple orders to cease his actions, calm down, best CIT efforts possible. He just, he wasn't listening. So we, uh, staff subjected him to uh, pepper spray, as the sheriff mentioned, to try to get him to comply with our orders to make sure it's safe for our staff. Um, just to point out on the bottom here, this is where the sheriff uh, in, uh, mentioned earlier, he had actually defecated himself um, and that's actually with the shorts on, so that's just there. So the deputy at this point, since this is our medical unit, we have a special uh, spray that is designed not to go outside the cell. It doesn't, it's not airborne, it's a gel. Um, so in th this, in this scene here, the deputy actually finally connects with the spray. You can see it starts to take effect pretty quick. 201 continued the effects of the pepper spray. This is as uh, team starting to get together to try to figure out who's going to be on the team and get him out of there. The plan was at that point was to get him out, secure him in the uh, wheelchair, and wheel him to the shower to try to get him cleaned up. On top of getting him cleaned up, we'd have to get that cell cleaned up. And as the sheriff mentioned earlier, get the impact resistance seclusion cell emptied, cleaned before we could put him in there. So 205, he slips and kind of carries down the toilet there. Staff is just outside that door getting ready to go in. 207, <clears throat> staff lays down a couple blankets here in an effort to try to prevent them from being contaminated by the biohazard and to make sure they're, they're not going in there and slipping because you can see it's, it's slippery. But you can see Mr. Peters, the blanket lands on his hand and he tosses it off and they attempt to throw a second blanket in there. Same scenario, he tries to toss it off. This is when the deputies go in to assume control. You can see he's actively resisting. Two deputies at the top are securing with handcuffs and the deputy toward the bottom is putting leg shackles on and then they're handing him, that's the, the spit shield the sheriff talked about. See here, once he's, once he's secured, the staff carries him out of the cell. Different camera angle here. You see the staff places him in the wheelchair. And they wheel him back towards the shower. Uh, towards As he got to the shower, he, he started uh, Wiggling, wiggling his way out of the wheelchair, but the deputies took him in the shower to try to shower him off. Not an easy task. He starts fighting uh, in the shower. So at that point, uh, the, one of the supervisors on scene changed plans. They eliminated the plan for the, the rubber room, the in impact resistance occlusion cell, we call it the rubber room. Um, and they changed paths to put him in the pro strength chair instead just to make sure he doesn't uh, hurt himself further. So this is as staff is trying to, now when somebody's wrestling, somebody's wrestling and they want to fight going in the chair, it's hard. It's hard to put somebody in the chair. It takes four or five deputies sometimes. So they're, they're definitely uh, 
earn their money here. So 218, uh, staff is finishing up trying to secure uh, Mr. Peters, and before they can get the final limb uh, secured, which is one of his arms, um, they realize he's, the resisting has slowed, as the sheriff uh, mentioned earlier. So they, they, the, the mission transitions to make sure he's okay. Um, So at about 2.21 at last scene, uh, medical staff, that nurse that was there, came over, checked and rec recognized a weak pulse, so they attempted multiple sternum rubs, sternum rubs and, uh, and used an ammonia capsule to try to get a reaction, and there was no reaction. So staff immediately began C uh, CPR, and they did that while he was still in the chair, as you can see, and that is something, honestly, that's something we don't train, but to do CPR successfully, you need a hard back, and that's a, that's a hard back, and I, I think the ad-libbing there was pretty solid. So at this point, staff is calling uh, for fire rescue, and the nurses went off to get to the emergency cart, which is coming right out, that, right out that door there. As the sheriff mentioned, that was a very rigorous CPR. The deputy did a great job there. So at this point, they go ahead and uh, remove Mr. Peters and un unhook the three limbs, and then they remove the chair and place them on the ground to continue life-saving measures. At this point, they attempt to use the AED, the defibrillator. Um, the defibrillator did not pick up a shockable rhythm, and it won't shock. It has to, your heart has to be doing something for the uh, AED to work or to shock, um, so there was um, no shockable rhythm at that point. CPR never stopped. At 2.36 is when Hernando County Fire and Emergency Services arrived. As you can see, jail staff continued with the compressions as fire rescue set up. At 244, this is where we wrap this up. 244 is where Hernando County Fire Rescue uh, leaves the medical unit, heads back to the ambulance, and heads over to Brevera Health uh, Brooksville. And about 29 hours later, uh, Mr. Peters expires at the hospital.
couple things I noticed there that I forgot to mention is that uh, you see that there was a second uh, spit restraint uh, because the first one had gotten damp, uh, either from uh, excrement, feces, things like that, or um, you know uh, the shower. So they were trying to replace that about the time that they realized that there was some uh, issues with Mr. Peters. Um, and as I said, uh, things like this happen every day, and people do unfortunately perish every day in emergency rooms and very similar circumstances. Uh, but because it is in a jail, uh, we have a have a uh, much more oversight, and that's why we called an FDLE as well as the state attorney's office, and uh, of course the medical examiner. Uh, there's no doctor to sign, obviously, so the medical examiner takes jurisdiction and does an autopsy. So either myself or uh, Major Kluznik will be happy to answer a couple questions before we move on to our uh, couple other ones. Anybody have any questions? The medical examiner said that he showed signs of excited delirium. Could that be a cause possibly that led to? Because they said the autopsy was undetermined. Yeah, I don't know if you can, if excited delirium can cause a death necessarily. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert in that. That would be something for the uh, medical examiner. But um, we have uh, both here and in other experiences in law enforcement, my experiences in, uh, in my agency to the south when I was down there. Uh, experiences of excited delirium and unfortunately um, uh, almost always the person ends up dying uh, whether it's a cause of death or whether they get so uh, excited that they uh, um, uh, resist enough to cause their death I don't know that would be something for the medical experts but it is something that happens and it's a very frustrating thing to deal with excited delirium uh, any other questions sure I've been watching the video today is there anything in watching it back that deputies you'd ask them to do differently or that you would do differently? Well, I will tell you that we um, think about that because obviously this is certainly not only not our goal, we want to do everything in our power to prevent it. And uh, when something like this happens, and we are probably harder on ourselves, believe it or not, than often the public is. And I can't see anything that uh, I can say definitively that had we done differently. Uh, or that we could have done differently that would have had a different outcome. Uh, obviously, we had to respond to the house initially when we got the call from the citizen, this person banging on the door. For the person, we couldn't calm them down and they refused to leave, so an arrest was really our only option. And we did have the person medically cleared. Uh, for almost 48 hours, roughly, uh, he seemed to be doing relatively well, all things considered, with a a minor issue in the middle there, but it, it was uh, fairly quickly it passed. I don't know how long he was in the pro strength chair. It was only for a few hours. Okay, a few hours, and then he was able to go back to being uh, what appeared, as you saw, to be relatively normal. It all seemed to really stem around the fact that he uh, decided he no longer wanted to take the detox protocol. I think he only took the first dose, correct? And he did not want to take the second dose. And um, that seems to be one of the major factors in him digressing so quickly. And as I said, it all happened relatively, within a few hours, it went from him seeming fairly normal to being totally irrational and very combative, so. So Sheriff, obviously we are seeing the totality of it, and your deputies and your medical personnel that endured that entire thing, but I'm sure somebody out there is gonna ask, um, he's in a locked jail cell, why not just let him ride it out? Well, and, 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 I, and I, you know, it's funny you should say that because I anticipated that question. And, uh, and as I said, some things that we could do would not be acceptable to the public. Leaving somebody who is totally irrational, likely to hurt themselves, slipping and falling in their own excrement and their own vomit is not something that we're going to do. We're not going to leave that person in there. You might even be able to argue we, you know, it took us an hour or two to get the cell ready. It also, I think they had to evacuate the medical wing for the most part. It looked like several of the, the bunks were empty, so we had to probably move people out of the medical wing because obviously when you have somebody combative, you don't want them either helping the person or getting hurt by the person. Um, so a lot of things had to go into play, and uh, you know, we probably would have moved him sooner had we had unlimited personnel and, and, and that type of thing, and unlimited <laughs> jail cells or impact resistant cells. Um, so yeah, leaving him there was not an option. And I think you could make a strong argument that this, this outcome would have been the same, even if we had not 
taken action. And then we would have been criticized, why did you allow him to hit his head or why did you allow to continue there for hours and suffer? And we're not gonna, we're just not gonna do that. So, all right, any other questions and we can move on? All right, we'll move on to our next one here. Thank you, Major. Um, our next one we'll talk about is, um, Uh, Mr. Stephen Sims, we received four tips about Mr. Sims uh, from January through March. And April of this month, just a few days ago, we did execute a search warrant at his residence on uh, Gifford Drive in Spring Hill. He was arrested on 10 counts initially of possession of child pornography. Um, a couple a day or so later, uh, through extraction of uh, uh, electronic devices, we were to add an additional 90 counts for a total of 100 counts of possession of trial pornography. He's currently being held in the Hernando County Jail uh, with no bond. He does have a couple prior arrests, nothing related to this type of activity. He was uh, arrested for burglary of a conveyance. Uh, and he was given pretrial detention back in 1993, and then a year later in 1994, he was uh, arrested for grand theft and gave three, given three years rather probation. Um, interestingly enough, or sickening enough, is that um, my deputies, uh, I think some of us even um, thinking about child pornography uh, is repulsive to say the least and turns our stomach. Um, I, I don't think most people can imagine what my detectives have to go through uh, because we obviously have to look at it enough to validate that it is actually pornography and there is actually a child involved. And in at least one of the videos I was told by my detectives that uh, it was a, a child that was between two and four months old uh, involved in one of the uh, videos and another one the child was between four and six years old. And we have found probably at least 153 different videos or still images on his uh, devices. And uh, he is uh, certainly uh, facing some significant charges as well as some significant jail time uh, up to and including life in prison. Um, we, I know the question is probably gonna be asked, do we know of any victims locally or did he have any victims? And we don't know of any local victims and we don't know of him being involved in any of those. Right now, the only evidence we have is his possession of child pornography. But of course, if any citizens have any information to the contrary, we would love to talk to them, but we don't have any information uh, to that effect as it stands at the moment. Now, the next individual we have, and uh, I think he has an appropriate last name, his name is Joshua Glenn Blight. Um, I think most people might believe he is a Blight. He was, uh, he was residing at uh, 11811 Broad Street in Lot 26 in Brooksville. And we received a tip in March that he may also have some child pornography. And so on April 12th, just a couple days ago, we did a search warrant on his residence. And we also found and arrested him for 10 counts of child possession, or possession rather of child pornography. Um, and he's currently being held in the Hernando County Jail under no bond status as well, pending further investigation. But what might also turn your stomach on him with his situation is he has previous arrests. He's actually a se registered sexual offender. He isn't on any special conditions, but he was originally arrested in Illinois back in 1998 when he was 17 and he was arrested for aggravated criminal sexual abuse on an individual who was 11 years old and a family friend. A few years later in 2003, also in Illinois, he was charged and we're having some difficulty finding the details of this. The charges seem a little bit strange based on what little bit we know, but he was arrested for armed robbery, aggravated criminal uh, sexual assault, as well as kidnapping. He was only convicted of the kidnapping and we have some information it might have been some sort of armed robbery. I don't know how the sexual uh, assault charge was uh, uh, determined when they, he was arrested at the time, but he was only convicted of, uh, in that situation of kidnapping and he served 54 months in the Department of Corrections at, uh, in Illinois. Again, he was charged with 10 counts right now of uh, 
possession of child pornography. We also found during the search warrant some methamphetamine as well as paraphernalia. And he uh, right now stands uh, of charges that could lead up to 156 years in prison. Uh, bottom line is, is these individuals, if we get tips on individuals that are involved in child pornography, because uh, that obviously either here or someplace else in the world is going to be uh, a very horrific act on a very young person. We are certainly going to take every uh, reasonable means without violating their rights to make sure that justice is served and that they don't uh, have the opportunity to decide to defend on anyone uh, here in Hernando County. So with those, I'll, I'll answer a couple questions. They're pretty cut and dried cases. I don't know if I can answer a whole lot, but again, uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Any questions on those? Sure. In regards to the, there's a lot of parents interested about what happened at Fox Chapel Middle School. Um, yeah. The school district came out yesterday and said they got new information which led them to remove the teacher from the classroom. Can you tell us what that new information is? Well, I believe, you'd have to ask them, but I believe that the information that we had done a risk protection order um, eventually, I guess, made it to the decision makers to take some action with regard to that person's employment. Uh, I, I, as I said in our press release, uh, employment decisions are entirely the decision of the school district. It's, so we are certainly not involved in that decision, whether to allow somebody to stay there, whether to discipline them, whether to move them, that is entirely up to the school district. Um, there, we are doing some checking as to, um, I know that there was some discussions with individuals in the district uh, that we were in the process of obtaining a risk protection order, but I'm not sure who that made it to or when it made it to that, that individual. So that's something we're kind of work with to make sure that uh, our, our lines of communication were open, but it's certainly uh, um, you know, something we're gonna have to look into a little further. They made it sound like there was new information. No, there, there, there wasn't uh, any n new information other than we went through the process of getting, I, I, I am assuming that that is the only new information that a decision maker got. We didn't come up with any new information since we've uh, initiated the risk protection order that I'm aware of. But I think it was because we were able to get a risk protection order and because the judge determined that uh, this person should not possess firearms for uh, a year, that that was something that may have uh, given them uh, the ability to make a decision, a different decision in the employment status. But you'd have to ask them particulars. Okay? Any other questions? All right. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great day. And if you need anything, Obviously, you can contact us through the website or through the public information officer if you're with traditional media. Thank you all.